Good morning. Good morning again, my name is Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome you to the place of worship. We join in to worship our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. And we thank you for this opportunity that we can come only to the throne room of grace and mercy by the blood of the Lamb. And enter in to a personal God, not a make-believe God, not a figment of our imagination, not just a preached word, but the real living God. We don't worship like yesteryear. We don't worship a prophet. We just don't worship a religious figure. We worship the risen King. And our faith is in you, Lord, as being the risen King. So this morning we come boldly to express that in praise and worship. We come boldly as brothers and sisters gathered around from different parts of local, different parts of Gaston County to come and to just experience a corporate worship with our Lord, with our God, who share the same faith that knowing that Jesus is our Lord and our personal Savior, knowing that he died and resurrected of all authority and power on earth and in heaven, and that no one took his life, but that he laid down for us so that now he can boldly pick it up and give us the right to become sons and daughters of the Most High God and to be in relationship with him and to know him as who he is, our King, our Lord, the only begotten Son of our Father, that we have the freedom and liberty to enter in now and to worship and to express this love out of our bodies to other people. So Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us and who you are in us. So this morning, as we worship, guide us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, you saw on earth, you said the promise. You told the disciples, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Lord, we are people. Remind us of who we are and what we feel with and what we need this morning. We need the power of your Holy Spirit to help us. We need your Holy Spirit to help us. Thank you for the preached word, but we need the anointing, the yoke destroying, bread renewing anointing of your Holy Spirit to be present in this building today. We need that fresh anointing, Lord. We need the deposit for what your Spirit gives to us when he came upon earth to live inside of us, after the Holy Spirit come upon you, that you shall receive that dunamis, that power, to live, to know him, to walk with him. The Lord, so we ask you that that be filled in us. Pause us continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. Continually fill us up, Holy Spirit. We need to continue filling. It's not a religious feel, it's you who fills us. So we submit to your feeling, Holy Spirit, to remind us of the goodness of the Father who bears witness of our Lord Jesus this morning inside of us. Lord, stir our spiritual man up, Lord. Help us, Jesus. Help us. Help us, Lord. As we desperately thirst and long for your presence, we need you, Jesus. A nice song just won't do it. A nice sermon just won't do it. But you can and you will, Lord. You said you will not withhold any good thing from them that loves you, Lord. Any good, anything from them that loves you, Lord. You will not withhold any good thing from them that loves you, Lord. And you are a promise keeper, God, who stands by your word. So this morning, remind us of how good you are. And that you're faithful, Lord, unto your sons and your daughters. And that you have to forsake us, Lord, turn your back from us. And that this morning we worship and remind us of your goodness, of your faithfulness, of your love, of your truth, of your word, your scripture. Let it become bread to our spiritual man, Lord, that we may eat of. And truly see the life of that word been alive in us. Thank you for declaring this day that this is the day the Lord has made. We cannot hear rejoice and be glad in it. For every day, Lord, you made, you said it's good. Every day, Lord, we go back to recall. And everything you made, and from every day you made, you said it was good. The fall doesn't take that away. The fall doesn't make the day evil because the fall is a big day. You did. And you have to be over the fall. And through that, Lord, we can declare that in any situation, that all things does work together for the good of those who love the Lord. The Lord called according to his purpose because you spoke good over the day. 
because of mishaps that comes along, the things that happen, you declare the good, and we can rest in your goodness, rest in your word, rest in who you are. Help us, Lord, to remind us of these things, that we don't get captivated and caught up in the world and fall of the world, but remind us of who you are and what you said. And we bless you, we honor you, we thank you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome, Holy Spirit. You're welcome. In us, to show us the way. Empower us. You're welcome to help our hearts and our minds, Lord. Let us rest in you, Jesus. Rest in your spirit. We bless you. We honor you. We thank you, Father.
And you just didn't take all that punishment. Kind of a, I'll pay one time for all. But Lord, as I read, you endured all the sins of every individual on earth, past, present, and future. all the sins of man. So Lord, I can't quite believe you just laid down your life and said this is due for all of them. I believe, Lord, that you truly said there and endured every sin that we would ever commit. Each person. I'm in awe of that. Before a just man Hardly anybody would die. And a righteous man may be a couple. But for a sinner, that's that a God may love. I thank you for your love towards us, O oh Lord. Thank you for commending your love toward us yet while we were sinners. For we've all sinned and come short of your glory, O oh Lord. And we've all made a mockery of your gospel. We've all been half in, half out at times. We've all been sitting there snickering instead of listening and trying to be more, trying to be better. And you still died for that. You still died for us, Lord. You died for us in our disrespectful attitudes, Lord. You died for us, Lord, and loved us whenever we could care less about you. You're so good to us, Lord. You're a good, good Father. Lord, help us be serious about you. I know we only gather in a few numbers, Lord, but help these few numbers here to be for real. Help these few numbers here, Lord, to be on purpose. Lord, help these few numbers be effective. Everywhere we go, May we touch you with us. Willing and ready at any time to give an answer for the hope that lives within us. Always ready to minister to that one that needs help. No matter what they look like. No matter if their family or the whole world or the judicial system says that they're never going to be anything for them. Because you said they are. Because you said that we are. When everybody gave up on us, Lord. You said, no, they're going to get it. Prepay our salvation because you had faith in us that we were going to get it. Lord, help us, give us the discipline and the strength and the energy to do our part, Lord, to seek you out with our whole heart, with our whole being, with our whole faith, with our whole marriage, with our whole family, Lord. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. 
laid down his life for sinners like me. something that was pointed out to me just this week. 
I never took into consideration. When Abraham took it, he built the altar and he put Isaac on the altar. And then he was fixing to come down and thrust this knife into something that he's missed and desired for almost a hundred years. And then he's finally got this thing that he just desired so much. And was willing to sacrifice it to the Lord because the Lord asked him. And just before coming down with the blade to thrust it into this thing that he had wanted for a hundred years almost, the angel of the Lord hollered and said, no, no. And I believe that the message in that story was Abraham, I don't want your Isaac. I want your commitment. I never put more on you than you can bear. And a lot of times things happen in our life just checking our commitment status. It ain't things that we have to give up or have to get rid of. Because we're being punished for not being holy enough or good enough. But a lot of times we're so distracted, the Lord has to do a, a status check on our commitment level. And just look at it like this. That's the ancient of days doing inventory on his investment. You're his investment. You're his beloved. You're his much loved. And he just didn't let Jesus come and get put on the cross and then say, all right, I, I was just checking. Y'all ain't ready yet. He went all the way with his son. Job, in the middle of all his mess, lost it all. Seemed like he had nothing to live for. And I don't believe, and this is just me, I don't believe that his wife was coming with an attitude like you hear her portrayed a lot. Don't you just curse God and die? I think she felt so broken for her husband seeing him in that state all his youngs did all his handmaids all of his servants all of his barns all of his animals now here he is a righteous man covered in infection And I think she was so broken for him as she sat there and watched him scrape them bulls off of that clay pot. She was like, baby, would you just curse God and die? Have you not been through enough? And even in the midst of all his pain, he said, baby, you're talking foolishly. My commitment is greater than the pain in my heart right My commitment to the Creator is greater than all the loss I can see with my physical eyes. Something greater. Even though I can't quite put my finger on it, I know there's something greater in me. There's something greater. Even though I don't know what that might be, I've got to hold on. I know there's something greater. I just want to encourage your heart. I feel so intimate right now with the Lord. I just feel the Holy Spirit just like a soft hug. 
I just want to encourage you that how you be and ain't how you want to be. And you might be good, but that's not how you want to be. There's something greater. Look at all the creation. Look at everything God created. You think the the level of goodness and holiness and righteousness in your life right now is the best you can do? He just has to allow you to learn the, the wisdom and experience. That was the issue with Adam and Eve. All of a sudden they had all this knowledge but no wisdom. It's a dangerous place to be. We go through the levels and the steps of this process to gain the wisdom and experience to be able to go to the next level. So where you are, even though it might be great, you might be sitting around uh, crisscross applesauce talking in tongues, feeling the whole Holy Spirit all the time. You might be calling the dead back to life. You might be rebuking disease. You might be men in marriages. You might be doing all kinds of things. Really great, supernatural, awesome, holy things for the Lord. And even that ain't as good as it gets. Something great. Can you believe that? I know you can believe it for somebody else. But can you believe it for you? Would you dare to believe? Would you have the courage to believe there's something greater even for you? There's something greater Even though you might not be able to put your finger on it Would you believe there's something greater for you? There's something greater That only God Himself can give Can you believe you there's something greater. A gift, if you will, from God on high. At a time. A gift, if you will, from God on high.
They said, Jesus, we don't know what to do. They said, this thing is tearing up my kid and it's throwing him in the fire. Sometimes he's okay, but just out of nowhere for no reason at all. And Jesus walked right by the young boy. Sitting there convulsing and slobbering, probably growling and wallering. And he turned to the Father. Daddies, we gotta get our house in order. We gotta keep our babies covered. I know we gotta go to work. I know we gotta be the provider, but we also gotta be the priest. We gotta get our houses in order, Daddy. I know we gotta be the protector, but we also gotta be the priest. We gotta get our aching backs out of the bed in the middle of the night when the Lord wakes us up. Cover our kids always. Like Jesus said, Peter, don't you know? Satan desires to sift you as weak. What else would the enemy like better than to sift our children as weak?
every soul in our sound of my voice, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing in their lives. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Lord, bless this word that's fixing to come forth. Bless this vessel that's bringing the Lord use his mouth. Have your way with it, Lord. Cover it, Jesus. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Is that you or me, bro? I think that's you. Okay, good. Good morning. Um, you know, God's awesome, right? I mean, just working through His people, working through His ministers, working through, you know, an adapted version of praise and worship, if I might say this morning. And... It's just all about being and following that Holy Spirit of God, right? That's what it's all about. Being in tune, being in touch, listening for and acting upon, you know, the things that He's leading us to do or to share or to say. So, <clears throat> as we get into what I feel like He's given me to, to share today, um, I want to just pray and ask for Him to continue to lead us and guide us. Father, Lord, God, we just come before You again, just asking You to lead us and guide us by and through Your Holy Spirit into Your Word. Uh, close my mouth and everything that comes from my mouth. Father, let it be in honor and glory and, and praise unto You and uplifting Your name and giving instruction and teaching and guidance. Uh, that you would have us to receive this morning. Give us ears to hear and a heart to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so, um, first, I would just like to take a real brief moment to say I have some of my extended family here this morning. Johnny and Josie's back there. Love you guys. Thanks for coming. And, 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 to see this young guy sitting here this morning. Uh, what a trooper, dude. I mean, you know. Um, inspiration. Be where you've been this week, going through what you've been doing this week, as well as the family. Um, yeah, I texted Richard last night and I said, I know you guys had a lot going on, man. Are you, you know, I was just checking to see if they were going to be here this morning to do praise and worship because, you know, if they weren't going to be able to be here under all that they were dealing with, uh, then I was going to get with Scott or somebody and put some, you know, just put some tracks together or something for the service. That's why I was, that's why I was texting you. But praise God. Yeah, God, he's a miracle working God, right? Everything that he's been through with this appendix stuff could have went so far south and it didn't. So to see you here this morning is fantastic, Maddox, and the rest of the family. So we're going we're gonna to talk about a uh, couple of parables this morning. We're not going to be detailed, detailed, detailed into every one of them. It's going to be kind of a, a brief of each parable and then kind of looking at what's in that parable and what's in that parable. Okay? It's a, and, and the title of this, the, the message, if, if you are a person that likes to go by titles, is walking between the lines. Walking between the lines of God's Word. Okay? So, with that said, when it comes to knowing God's Word, let me, let, I want to throw a couple of trivia questions out there for you. Who likes trivia? She threw her phone straight up in the air. Who likes trivia without their phone in their hand when it's real trivia, right? <laughs> so,
so you know let, let's let's throw back to the Old Testament for example um, the book of Ruth I said oh man the book of Ruth what, what kind of trivia questions coming out of the book of Ruth right well, I got a question for you. We, we all know, you know, if you've read the book of Ruth, you know the story of, of Ruth and Boaz and, and, and everything and how they met and, and, and all this stuff. We know what kind of man that Boaz was before Ruth. But what kind of man was Boaz, excuse me, after Ruth? We know what kind of man he was after he met Ruth. What kind of man was he before he met Ruth? Any shots? It was ruthless. Where's my drum roll? Yeah, yeah. Where's my drum roll? It was ruthless, right? Laughter worketh as a medicine. I hope you didn't laugh too hard on that, Maddox, you know. Don't want to get you going too much there. Huh? He didn't get it. Well, he's an Ohio, Ohio State fan. That's why he didn't get it. A little bit slow up there, if you ask me. So, I could throw another one out at you. You want me to throw another one out at you? Huh? Patrick's going like, man, come on, what is it? Anybody know who the first drug addict was in Scripture? Anybody want to take a shot? This is not just random stuff. This is for a purpose. It's got an intended purpose later. Nebuchadnezzar, man, he was on grass for seven years. <laughs> was he not? <laughs> right? He was on grass for seven years. Okay, I'll give you a real easy one. In the beginning of time, everybody knows creation of, of, of Adam, right? What did God say after he created Adam? This is an easy one. What did he say after he created Adam? Two correct answers, but they're wrong. After he created Adam, he actually said, I can do better than this, and he created Eve. I thought that one would get the, the, the girls going, okay? Yeah, yeah. All right, so enough of my, my um, what do you call that stuff? <laughs> I thought it was stand-up comedy, but anyway. All right, so there is a purpose for, for what we just did, though. Okay? I like to laugh in the Lord, not at the Lord, in the Lord. You know, and I think he gives us a spirit of laughter sometimes, and it work. It does work uh, as a medicine in our lives. But also, there was the idea of what else is behind that. You know, well, okay, I'm asking a question, but what's behind that question? You got the two correct answers: made you in my image, and it, it, it was good for Adam, but there's something else in there that I threw in there, right? Now, it was being funny and, and uh, uh, a little bit of a comedian, but when we talk about walking between the lines of Scripture, I want to give you some examples this morning of exactly what that means, because until you really begin to walk between the lines of the scripture that you have in your hands until you really begin to get into the into part of the parables you're really not seeing everything you're not re you really don't have that connection that can take you to another level in your walk with the lord you just read it and you take it for what it is which is good it's truth it's all truth it's absolute truth but it's when you start to realize that there's something behind that. There's something in between the chapters, the verses, the scriptures, the sentences themselves. All right? So we're going to be dealing with two very familiar parables. 
And uh, one of them is going to be, you don't have to turn there yet. Um, I'll be turning there and reading them. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. I'll be reading everything that we're going over this morning. If you do have a Bible and you want to follow along. Um, we'll be doing the, the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. All right. Um, Jesus, when, when we present this well, I'll tell you what. Let's go ahead and read it. I was going to wait to read it a little bit later, but we'll go ahead and read it now. Luke 15, if you want to follow along, or I'm going to read it. It's not going to take that long. Very familiar passage. The parable of the lost son. Luke 15, starting at verse 11. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his life in wild living. After he had spent... Um, excuse me, I don't want to miss anything. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry. He refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost. Now, Jesus spoke in parables a lot. Do you know why he spoke in parables a lot? Some, some of the answer to that is, is very simple. He spoke in parables because he, he was bringing something that was brand new to the people. Whether it be religious leaders that was sitting under the sound of his voice, or whether it be, you know, totally townspeople or whatever sitting under the sound of his voice, or whether it be soldiers of the Roman Empire sitting under his voice, he was bringing something new. So he spoke in parables in order to be able to give these people something to compare to what he was trying to teach them at the time. Okay, does that make sense? In other words, he was basically painting a picture in words, trying to paint a picture so they could see more clearly of what he was teaching or preaching and bringing when he was bringing it, right? Because, trust me, 
Everybody, every single one of them was totally in the blind of what was on the scene when Jesus came. The covenant that he came to bring and to present in the manner and the fashion that he brought it and presented it was totally unknown to everybody around him. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scholars of scholars could not see what he was bringing. So this brand new teaching, this covenant of grace that he was coming to implement from the Father, he used parables in, in things that they were familiar with, things that they related to in their daily lives, things that they could understand and, and, and try to catch a glimpse of what he was bringing. Okay? But let's listen to what he said about that very question. The other parable that we're going to go to... <clears throat> is in um, Matthew. And <clears throat> let's see. Start at. I just feel led to. I'm waiting on the Lord. We're going to go to Matthew 13. And we're, we're ready to go there. That's all. In Matthew 13, verses 1 through 23, this is, this is what's going on. Everybody knows um, or may be familiar with the parable of the sower, right? So starting in verse 1, it says this. Um, Jesus was had presented many parables before and many parables after. But in this particular one, the same day that Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake, such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell along rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, and thirty times that, was, that which was sown. He who has ears, let him hear." Okay. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has, taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is filled, the, is filled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They, har they hardly hear what their ears and they have closed their eyes. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Now, to fully understand what Jesus is talking about there, um, when we're going through the parable of the sower, 
Um, we'll, we'll get into that in just a minute. But the key point is the hearing, seeing, and perceiving. And not hearing and seeing and perceiving. Okay? Some of that hasn't changed in, in the world that we live in today. As it was back then, notice he told the disciples. What did he tell the disciples? That what? Y'all remember? Secrets? Yeah. Kingdom of heaven. It's been given to you, but not them. Why? Because they were seeing. They were hearing. They were perceiving. They were accepting. Prime example is a passage that Richard alluded to in praise and worship. When Jesus presented the teaching of eating of the body and drinking of the blood, what happened? Now we know that he was making a reference to communion with God and what was to come at the cross, right? But at the time when he presented that teaching, what happened? A lot of the disciples said, whoa, this dude's preaching cannibalism. I mean, literally, you know, he's... If I'm, if I'm sitting there and I'm hearing that and I'm not perceiving what's going on, I'm not truly hearing what's going on, I'm out of there, dude. I ain't getting into no cannibalism stuff, right? But the difference between the ones that left and the ones that stayed was what? When he turned and he's at, he asked his, his 12, you want to go too? And Peter said, Where do we go, Lord? You have the words of life. Why did he understand that? Because he had been hearing and listening and perceiving. He had been walking between the parables. He had been walking between the verses. And that's why he was able to see Father and understand that there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> Dude, you got the words of life here. There's nowhere else to go. You see, a lot of people that follow Jesus, when we hear the groves of people that follow Jesus, like these, there were so many people that gathered there to hear His teaching um, on, on this one particular day that He had to get into a boat and get out onto the water so the people could line up on the shoreline. Evidently, that wasn't at the Mount of Olives, right? Where he could get higher than the people, whatever. So he got out on a boat where they could hear him. And then he gives them this parable of the sower. So what exactly was going on in that parable, right? There's four places in that parable that you can find yourself this morning. And I'm not going to tell you where you're at. You're, you're going to listen to what I'm about to share with you. And then you can determine where you feel like you are in this particular parable. Okay, that Jesus was, was bringing forth. The first one. When um, <clears throat> a farmer went out and sowed his seed as he was scattering seeds, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. You heard, 